Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming. I am Usha George, Interim Vice President, Research and Innovation at Ryerson University. On behalf of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council and the Royal Canadian Institute of Science, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this year's foundation lecture featuring the 2016 John C. Polanyi Award winner, Dr. Barbara sherwood Lollar. I'd like to first of all congratulate Dr. Barbara Scholar Dollar for being the winner of this prestigious award. Join us this evening, joining us this evening are a few distinguished guests that I'll introduce right now. And I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Mario Pinto, President of the National Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Peter Love, President of Royal Canadian Institute of Science. And of course, Dr. John C. Polanyi, Canadian Nobel Prize winner in chemistry and professor at the University of Toronto. I'd also like to acknowledge Ryerson's president, Dr. Mohamed Lashimi, whose leadership is instrumental to Ryerson's innovation agenda. This is the sixth consecutive year that Ryerson is hosting this foundation lecture. It's our privilege to do so, and we are extremely delighted uh, to host this once again. In addition to honoring the prize winner, this event enables scientists and everybody else to come to contact with each other, to collaborate, to talk about innovations that are happening in science, and to, to create a network of uh, individuals who will share the same ideas around what's happening in this world. I hope you'll uh, join uh, after the lecture uh, for the reception that's going to happen, and I'm sure Dr. Barbara's uh, Sherwood Lola's lecture will provide us enough material to have all kinds of different conversations. I would now like to introduce Peter Love, the president of Royal Canadian Institute for Science. He's also the president of the Energy Services Association of Canada and an adjunct professor at York University where he teaches courses in energy efficiency. He also serves on several corporate and nonprofit boards including Energy Efficiency Alberta, the Ontario Climate Consortium, and the Rethink and Rethink Sustainability. While attending UFT in the 70s, Peter was one of the first to join newly formed group called Pollution Probe. After graduating, he was hired by Probe and was on the team that developed the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Peter also received his MBA from the University of Toronto. Please welcome Peter Love. Uh, great to be here again, and thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, we were here last year in this auditorium, and, and uh, we're delighted to be here. I'm really honored to be the president of this organization. Uh, it's a great honor for me. Um, it's an organization. Uh, just a show of hands, how many people are members of RCI? All right, great, so you, you know our story. Um, it's interesting, Canada is celebrating its 150th anniversary. It's a very exciting time for Canada. Uh, RCI, uh, we go back 168 years. Very few organizations in Canada can claim that sort of heritage. Um, and it's, it's particularly interesting tonight to, to reflect on this, as some of you may know, and maybe some of you are celebrating. Uh, who's got a Scottish tradition, Scottish heritage? Can we get some Scots here? And so those of you who would know, and others who aren't Scottish also may know this is Robbie Burns' birthday. Um, so happy birthday to all the Scots. But um, so congratulations for being Scottish. And <laughs> But I, the reason I bring that up is that uh, our founder, uh, Sir Sanford Fleming, uh, also was a very noted Scotsman um, who came to Canada. Uh, and among other things, he was the one that created 
uh, what was called the, the, the Canadian Institute back in 1849, uh, later received a royal charter from Queen Victoria in 1851. And it was interesting, he brought together a group of entrepreneurs um, and, uh, and engineers and fellow surveyors like himself, and their goal, as he put it, was to do great good to a, my adopted country. Um, and that was what he created the, the uh, Institute to do. Um, our vision is an informed public uh, and that, that embraces science uh, to build a stronger Canada. And we couldn't do that without organizations uh, like NSERC, um, who provides the funding for our fundamental scientists. Uh, those of you who are members of RCI know that we put on free public lectures um, uh, in Toronto and, and are looking to expand that to other jurisdictions. We've done some in other cities. So we think this, that, that, that it, having an informed public uh, understanding science is important, but that's only impossible if we have world leading scientists, and we do, and it's with the support of NSERC uh, that's, that made, that's made possible. So I want to thank NSERC for their leadership, and we're delighted to have Dr. Mario Pinto uh, with us, who's the president of NSERC. Um, before joining NSERC, Dr. Pinto held a number of positions uh, at Simon Fraser University, spanning 30 years, including professor of chemistry, uh, chair of the Department of Chemistry, and vice president of research. Uh, as a chemical biologist, Dr. Pinto's interests span the diagnosis and, or treatment of bacterial and viral diseases, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. Now he's received a number of awards, I won't list those, but one of the advantages is of, the, of this evening is I had a chance to have dinner with him and, and uh, found out some even more interesting things about him that at, uh, at his great embarrassment I'll share with you. Um, but he plays guitar every morning at six o'clock in his office uh, as a way to get himself ready for the day, which I think is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, um, and we won't ask him for a guitar solo tonight. And then he's on the way over, he told me that he was actually a, a solo, soloist in a school choir uh, across the road at Massey Hall. So a man of many, many uh, talents. We're delighted to have Mario. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter, for that kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here tonight representing NSERC at this foundation lecture hosted by the Royal Canadian Institute for Science. First of all, I would like to thank RCI Science for their continued collaboration with NSERC. This lecture is a wonderful way to communicate the work of Canada's top researchers to a public that wants to know more about science. Simply put, this is an ideal forum for scientific dialogue. And dialogue, the two-way sharing of information and viewpoints, is a key driver of discovery and innovation. In my view, we must restore the lost art of dialogue and go back from the ridiculous to the sublime. Tonight, I have the opportunity to introduce you to the 2016 winner of the John C. Polanyi Award, one of NSERC's top research awards, Dr. Barbara Sherwood Lawler. And I'm thrilled that Dr. Polanyi, winner of the 1986 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, is with us here in the audience and has taken time out of his busy schedule to be with us. So please join me in thanking Dr. Polanyi. The award, named in honor of Dr. Polanyi, recognizes an individual whose research has led to an outstanding recent advance in the natural sciences or engineering. For someone so well grounded in earth sciences, Dr. Sherwood Lawler is one of the brightest shooting stars in Canadian science. I might mention that she continues the rich tradition of world-renowned earth scientists at the University of Toronto. The department was put on the map internationally by J. Tuzo Wilson, who made major contributions to our understanding of plate tectonics in the late 60s. Dr. Sherwood Lawler holds a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Isotopes of the Earth and Environment. She was also recently honored as a Companion of the Order of Canada, Canada's highest honor. But even in these prestigious groups, she stands out. It is not just the impressive list of publications and editorial work for learned journals, and not just the long list of students she has mentored, nor the many grants and awards. 
including a considerable number of from Enzo that make us stand out. But it's also her commitment to science outreach and the sharing of her discoveries with the public. She has been profiled in a wide variety of mass media and has spoken and given advice to politicians and other decision makers. I mentioned a mo moment ago that dialogue is a key driver of discovery. And Dr. Sherwood Lawler, I applaud you for your commitment to scientific dialogue, not only with peers and students, but also with the broader community. Today, we are looking forward to hearing about the science you do. It involves exploring some of the great mysteries of the solar system, life on Mars. By looking carefully at billion-year-old water found two kilometers below the surface of this planet. I think your work serves as an exemplar of what discovery research can and should be. You have persevered in the face of skepticism from less ambitious peers. You have, in fact, dug kilometers deep into the Earth to find the answers to questions that millions on the surface of the planet think about. Mesdames et Messieurs, j'ai le grand plaisir de vous présenter la conférencière de ce soir. Please join me in welcoming our speaker this evening, Dr. Barbara Shawilala. and make sure it's working, which you'd think from all my years of teaching I would have. Uh, but to be able to speak to a hometown crowd. Uh, so thank you all very, very much for the invitation from RCI to be here, for so many friends and colleagues to, and family members to have come out this evening. Uh, it's a really great pleasure to be able to show you a little bit of perspective on some of the work we've been doing uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so um, at the University of Toronto, but also, as you'll see with these in a moment, it involves a lot of work uh, that's done with colleagues all over the world. Um, there we are. Thank you. I'll turn up the sound a bit. I'd also, it's good to have the slides. <laughs> Okay, we're up and running now, thank you. Uh, so what I'll be talking about is life in the deeps, and as you'll see as I get to the end, there's a reference to Jules Verne, to Captain Nemo, and we'll tell you a little bit about how that all fits in as I get down to the end of the talk. That's the uh, literary reference in today's talk. Essentially, when people think about deep life or deep fluids, this is almost always the kind of iconic photograph that comes to mind. This, of course, is a picture of the Alvin out of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And this is a picture of one of the many places that the Alvin has discovered throughout the world in its dives, taking a look at the hydrothermal vents. But if you look back at the history of vent exploration, you'll know a very intriguing fact, and that that is, back in the 70s, when many of these dives were taking place to the deep, dark parts of the ocean, the dives contained geologists and physicists and oceanographers and chemists, but no biologists were brought along because being in the dark ocean floor, the thinking was that there would not be any life to take a look at. And when I was finishing high school, this was one of the great revolutions in earth science and biology, the understanding that in fact, there was life in the deep dark parts of the ocean. So people are often quite familiar with these pictures. And so it's important for me to emphasize is that although what we do is related to this kind of work, in fact, we're doing it in a very different environment. In our case, we are also looking at the same kinds of, of life, which are the chemolithotrophic life, that is life that derives its energy, not from photosynthesis, but from the energy of water-rock reaction, from the energy of chemistry. And that's the mechanism by which it can sustain itself even far away from the Earth's surface. And so we take a look at that kind of work, but we do it not in the marine systems, but in the continents of the world, in particular the Precambrian continents. So specifically what I'll be talking about today is the terrestrial deep biosphere and deep hydrosphere, but specifically in something that's very near and dear to Canadians, and that is the Precambrian crust. I'll tell you a little bit more about exactly what that is and where that's found around the world in a moment, but essentially what I'll be doing is giving you, to begin, a very quick overview of what we know about water, energy, and life in the world's oldest rocks. 
Essentially, these are the Precambrian rocks of the planet, the Precambrian continents, shown here in blue and green. The uh, blue is where it outcrops. You can actually walk on the surface of the Earth and encounter this rock. And of course, one of the most famous localities is the Canadian Shield. But this is also forms the core of many continents in uh, Southern Africa and Western Africa, South America, Scandia, um, Australia, etc. If you add up together not only the uh, mount that's exposed at the surface, but also in green, that which is buried under younger rocks, what you can see is that by and large, these Precambrian rocks make up more than 70% of the continental lithosphere by surface area. These are the oldest rocks on Earth. They're more than two to three billion years in age, and the remnants of the earliest continental formation on the planet. So they're a wide, broad, and vast amount of territory that we can investigate for life. But intriguingly, they've been very little explored compared to the marine system. And so we tackle these systems. What's particularly interesting about them is not only are they the oldest rocks on Earth, but they are tectonically quiescent in the current day. They're not undergoing uh, plate-tectonics or massive amounts of volcanism, for instance. So we work all over the world, but in particular, a lot of my work over the last 30 years has been focused around the Canadian Shield, Fennoscandia, and uh, Southern Africa. The Precambrian continents are an uh, area that is massively studied within Earth sciences, but typically as a repository of information on the ancient Earth. As I mentioned, most of these are two to three billion years in age, and therefore they are the places on the planet that allow us to investigate the history of the early Earth, ancient atmospheres, early life and its origins, and particularly important for Canada, they are also the site of many of our mineral resources. So they are a, uh, a site for gold, platinum, base metals, diamond research, etc. And typically when you think about Precambrian research, this is the kind of thing that we think about a repository, a gold mine of scientific information, but the typical way of thinking about it is in terms of it being ancient, fossil information, information about the earliest parts of Earth. So what will be a little bit different about the way we'll talk about this today is I will talk a little bit about what this means in terms of information about ancient processes. But it's important to identify early in the talk that in fact we're not just talking about the Precambrian rocks as some museum piece. In fact, I'm going to be focusing a lot in today's talk on ongoing processes within these rocks, and specifically ongoing processes of chemical reaction, because the same kinds of chemical reaction that we see so visibly taking place in the black smokers on the ocean floor at very high temperatures are still taking place within these older rocks, just on slower rates, lower temperatures, and longer time scales but they're very much still chemically reactive or chemically alive, and that, in fact, is the key to understanding the habitability of these rocks and the presence of extant life. So these rocks give us information not only about ancient life, but also about life that's present within these systems today. Interestingly, um, this, this phenomenon, which is shown here, this is a picture from one of our many sites around the world. This particular one is about one and a half kilometers deep, and it gives you a feeling for what it is we're working with. This is naturally occurring water discharging from fractures or boreholes in the rock. Now, we get down there typically either accessing it via mines or underground research labs, but the water is very much a natural phenomenon. And what's fascinating is this has been known to mining communities throughout the world uh, for a very long time. The earliest records of this in the annals of the Canadian Geological Survey of Canada date back to the 1880s. And yet somehow this had flown almost completely underneath the scientific radar. It wasn't until we began to investigate these here in Canada, some of the work I did with my PhD, but elsewhere around the world during the 1980s, that we began to scientifically grapple with a phenomenon that the mining communities had known about for over 100 years. So it's an interesting angle to think about how we do our science through communicating with community knowledge. And certainly, uh, I won't talk a lot about that today, but I think that's an intriguing aspect of this. So there's water in these rocks. What's that water like? The water is typically highly saline, and in fact, up to a brine consistency. It's dominated by calcium sodium chloride with a total dissolved solid. 
of up to 250 grams per liter. That simply means up to 10 times as saline as seawater. So it's very, very salty material indeed. The temperatures range from 20 degrees to a high of about 65 degrees. That's within the Woods Waters Land Basin in South Africa. But again, as I mentioned, the key thing is these are actually flowing waters. They uh, flow at water rates of uh, one and a half to about half a liter per minute. And uh, the gases dissolve from these as well. And you can see that bubbling, that exolution of dissolved gases, also at rates on the order of a liter per minute. Now, at many of these boreholes, those rates do die down over time. But I'll be talking to you today about uh, boreholes that were discovered in 2007. And almost 10 years later, we're continuing to get steady flow rates of this nature associated with them. So it is very much a macroscopic phenomenon. Uh, this gives you some sense then of what is dissolved in that water from the point of view of the kinds of things I'll be talking about in the context of microbiology. There's a lot dissolved in this water, but the things that I'll focus on here in particular are the dissolved reduced gases. And what I'm showing you here are some of our results in um, uh, white from one of our mines in uh, Kid Creek Mine in Timmins, Ontario, Canada. And just comparing that to Lost City, which is one of the classic marine hydrothermal vent systems. And it just makes the demonstration that if we take a look at levels of dissolved hydrogen, that these deep terrestrial groundwaters are as hydrogen rich as the hydrothermal vents, making them some of the most hydrogen rich environments on the planet. Hydrogen is present typically uh, up to 5 to 15 millimolar. To translate that into a volume percent, that means some of those bubbles that you just saw can be up to 50% hydrogen. Um, it contains large concentrations as well as methane, ethane, propane, and butane. And together, all of these are uh, substrates or food that microorganisms can use to, uh, to eke out an existence within these kinds of systems. So there's water, there's energy, and indeed, in many of these sites, there is life. What we know about life in these systems is drawn primarily from work that we've done with collaborators within uh, the Witchwaters Land Basin in South Africa. We've worked very closely for years with Esteban Herden at the University of Witchwaters Land in Bloemfontein, with T.C. Onstad at Princeton, and a number of other microbiologists, and working within the gold mines of South Africa over a period of about 15 years. Um, we've been able to characterize dozens of communities down to about one to one and a half kilometers. As we go deeper, though, that's where things get really interesting. And I'll focus somewhat more on those deep communities today, because there's been, as I say, dozens of studies on microbial communities down to about one to one and a half kilometers, um, not just in South Africa, but also done. There's a lot of work that's been done by the Scandinavians. If you're interested in this kind of thing, there's an immense literature out of Finland and Sweden. But as you go deeper into about two to three kilometers, there we know much, much less. To date, in fact, there's really only been two studies that have characterized what's been found in the deepest, oldest, and most saline waters. And what I always say is fascinating about this is that there's two papers, but what's important to understand is that there's actually, they were both from the same place. It actually, more importantly than that, they're both from the same borehole. So we really got an N equals one in terms of our exploration of these very, very deep systems. The reason for that is multiple. Um, part of it is very high salinities are difficult to work in. And the second issue is very, very low biomass. These tend to be on the order of 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3 cells per mil. And just to put that in perspective, back in 2006 when we did that work, um, now, of course, technology has advanced. We now are able to do genomics on single cells. But back then, to get enough water to do this metagenomic analysis, a couple of these graduate students actually camped out overnight in the mine at 2.8 kilometers to filter enough water to do this analysis. So I like to highlight that because it simply makes the point that without the really courageous effort of all of our postdocs and graduate students, none of this would get done. Because I'd like to take a show of hands here amongst the professors that would actually camp out in a mine overnight to do this. You have to be young to, to want to have that much enthusiasm. Um, so that gives you a sense then of what the phenomenon is, where we're working, and what we're looking at in terms of water, energy, and life. Um, but what I want to make sure I emphasize is that this isn't just a particular place in South Africa or a particular place on the Canadian Shield. These are really an identification in these type sections or iconic places of processes that are taking place on a global scale. So I will talk just for a moment about some of this global aspect of this. 
because that was an important part of our understanding, that this is something that actually characterizes the old rocks of the planet. And so one of the other things to emphasize is that we have indeed, as I've mentioned, worked all over the world uh, on different continents. We've worked both in South Africa in places where we're looking at extreme files and very hot systems. We worked as well in uh, Nunavik in places like Lupin Mine in the north where we're looking at permafrost systems. So we looked at a gamut of sites throughout the world. And a couple of years ago, what we did was to take all of the data from all of these sites where we and other people had worked just to try to pull together an understanding of exactly how much of this hydrogen that I've emphasized, how much of this is being produced. If we take a look at measurements from all of these sites all over the world, again, characterized by very high levels of hydrogen, and actually try to do some mass balance modeling to understand the rate of production out of the continental lithosphere. It seems like a simple thing to do, but what was fascinating is prior to this paper, which we did in 2014, this calculation had been done dozens of times for the marine crust to understand how much hydrogen is produced by alteration of the marine crust. But it had never been done for the continents. It was a very strange thing. I think it was, you have to be Canadian to care about the continents. I'm not sure. But the fact remains that as soon as we did that, we discovered a very important fact. First of all, where all that hydrogen is coming from. There's a wide variety of different mineralogical and chemical reactions between water and rock that make hydrogen as a byproduct. But they fall into two large classes. One of them is radiolysis. And that essentially just means the radiolytic breaking up of water. These ancient rocks contain abundant radioactive uranium, thorium, and potassium. And as those elements undergo decay, they produce alpha, beta, and gamma particles. And as those particles, full of energy, bounce around in the rock, they hit water and break it apart into hydrogen. And that hydrogen can build up over time. This has been shown both experimentally and in modeling and in field work. So depending on where you are, a lot of radiolytic composition of water producing hydrogen. The second major category are hydration of mafic and ultramafic rocks. And again, these are reactions that are well understood. Within this kind of mineralogy, you should expect to get lots of hydrogen. For some reason, though, nobody had ever gone looking for it prior to, again, about the 1980s. But that's where the hydrogen is coming from. What was important was to do this calculation and try to understand how much was there. And what was fascinating is it showed us that essentially the contribution of global hydrogen production from these water rock reactions to the global hydrogen budget was the same as what was coming out of the ocean. But again, nobody nobody known it. So what that did was immediately double our estimate of global hydrogen production from radiolysis and hydration reactions. So it's a really important lesson to students as well. Never assume that people have actually done something. Get out there and explore. There are vast aspects of our planet that we still don't understand, that we still have not explored, that is still perhaps well known to the people who work there, the local communities, but science may not have tackled yet. And so what this did then, as I mentioned, doubled our estimate of hydrogen production on a global scale. And again, the reason that's important, well, because hydrogen is one of the main substrates that supports deep subsurface microbiology. Many of the metabolisms that these organisms use to survive depend on the use of hydrogen. So once we've discovered that we have a global presence of hydrogen-rich fluids deep within the Earth and all around the world, obviously one of the major aspects of our work over the last 10 years is to now explore those environments, explore those hydrogen-rich waters to understand what does live there. And people are very familiar with this idea of follow the water from the exploration of Mars but what we like to say is we're actually doing the same type of exploration for Earth. Follow the water deep into the Earth to use that to identify targets for understanding deep subsurface life. And the reason this is important is because of the type of environment we work in. And I have this slide here to talk a little bit about what groundwater is and how groundwater changes as you move into the Earth and through different rock types. Again, if we think about this strategy of follow the water, this is again what NASA or ESA uses to think about life on other planets, but it really is the same kind of concept when we think about the habitability of Earth. We need to understand where the presence of liquid water is because our understanding is that life as we know it requires liquid water. But more importantly, and this is really what I want to emphasize here, it's more than just the presence of liquid water. 
there actually has to be some potential for that water to flow and mix for life to really be able to survive a new system. And so what this really shows you then is how water flows and mixes in different regimes in the subsurface. Groundwater below our feet, the kind of groundwater that's used for uh, groundwater fed drinking water, is water that is typically found not in, sometimes we, we picture these underground rivers or underground caves. Groundwater actually isn't like that. A sponge is a better analogy. Groundwater essentially occupies the pore spaces between grains in the subsurface. But that's only down to a certain depth. If you get down into the kinds of crystalline rock that we see on the Canadian Shield, there these things have extremely low porosity. And there the water is in fact different. There in crystalline rock, what we have is a system called fracture controlled flow, where the water is found just within cracks within the rock. And as you can imagine, as you get even deeper into the kind of rocks that we're working in, many of those fractures are in fact isolated one from another. It's a system of hydrogeologic discontinuity. And so if you think about the nature of water within these systems, and think about what that means for the nature of life, it means you're entering a part of the planet where the distribution of life will be as patchy and as irregular as the water. And importantly, this kind of system where you have fractures that I can isolate connection from one part of water to another, is you have a system that literally provides virtual time capsules because the extent to which these fractures are cut off one from another or cut off from the surface then controls both the age of the fluid, how long life has been in them, and whether or not, in fact, uh, these fractures are inhabited at all because, of course, not all of them are. And so essentially, the way to think about it is a system in which life is isolated, both in space, within these fractures, but also in time. And to make a long story short, these fractures are not, at least on a geologic scale, static. It's not a locked-in system. There is dynamic movement within it. These fractures do open and close due to the changes in stress and due to fracture mineral precipitation. And so the fracture networks then have a mechanism to capture fluids and gas of different provenance and different age. And as we've looked at the age of these fluids, what we've seen is there's modern fluids near the surface, going down to tens of thousands of years at some depth. That's actually very common here in Ontario. Many of our deep groundwaters are from the last glacial cycle, 10,000 years old. But what's extraordinary about the systems that we work in is as you go even deeper, you're going quantumly back in time. And in South Africa, for instance, as you'll see in a minute, many of these waters are in fact tens of millions of years old. And then over the last few years, we've been able to push that back further still and indeed identify groundwaters on the Canadian Shield with a mean residence time for the fluid on the order of billions of years. So these fractures not only provide that isolation in space, but they provide this temporal variation in the supply lines for life. As I've mentioned, the deepest ecosystems so far published are the ones from South Africa, and those are indeed in waters that have about a 25 million year residence time. And I'll tell you, we're currently working on understanding whether or not anything's living in these very much older fluids. So that brings us to the key question that I always get asked, how do we have any idea how old these waters are? And the key to that are the noble gases. Of course, these are the conservative part of the periodic table, conservative and non-reactive in the subsurface. And what they allow us to do, amongst many things, in our context, is to provide constraints on the most recent connection to the surface or how long fluid has been isolated. And where we do that again, uh, we're taking advantage of that within these subsurface mines, going deeper and deeper all over the world. But I'll talk a lot in particular about this site today. This is the Kid Creek Mine, again in Timmins, Ontario, where the billion-year-old waters are from. And just to give you a sense of scale, this is the scale. This is the Kid Creek deposit. That's the CN Tower to scale. And just to let you know, um, uh, uh, an undergraduate, uh, two postdocs, and a graduate student from the University of Toronto just spent the last few days about there at 2.4 kilometers. Now, we don't make them sleep underground. They get to come up and stay at the Motel 8 afterwards. But. Um, again, working all over the world. Uh, this, is work, this is work began back to actually I put these in for my colleague here from uh, Sudbury. I wanted to make sure I showed her some pictures from the Sudbury area. This is work we did back in Sudbury in the 80s, working at about 4,000 feet to 4,600 feet in Matagi, Quebec. 
Uh, at Kid Creek, as I mentioned, we're working down about 7850. That's about 2.4, 2.5 kilometers. And, um, but I wanted to come back to this issue of the uh, South Africa because, as I mentioned, these are the ones where we fully characterize and publish the metagenomic sequence. And again, just to remember that it's so far at 2.8 kilometers depth and uh, waters of 25 million years in age. And in fact, that was an extremely important part of that paper because we needed to be able to show how long those microbes had been cut off from the surface and sustained on chemosynthesis rather than photosynthesis. So although it's a microbiology paper, the geochemistry coming out of the noble gases was very much a fundamental part of this. And I emphasize that because I've often been asked, you know, are you becoming a biologist now, a microbiologist? Well, I'm not. I am an isotope geochemist and a card-carrying geologist, but I'm smart enough to work with very smart microbiologists. And it's really only by putting together these kinds of techniques that you can really characterize and understand these systems. Noble gases have been used for a very long time, but it's only recently that they're beginning to become a tool that geomicrobiologists and microbiologists are beginning to understand the advantages of. So it's one of these areas where that interdisciplinary richness has really paid off for all of us. This is a lesson in what happens if uh, Ripley's, believe it or not, gets hold of your uh, data. Um, this was their interpretation of the radiolytic source of hydrogen. Of course, completely uh, a misreading of the work, but uh, it's just there to give you a sense of what can happen if um, media outreach uh, goes unchecked. So, deeper waters yet. These are the ones at Timmins in um, northern, uh, as you know, about eight hours north of here in Timmins, Ontario. Uh, we started out at about 2.4 kilometers, but now working down to about three kilometers. Again, what's beautiful about this deposit is that it is ancient seafloor. So it was originally laid down like this, but it has been inverted over time. So as they follow the ore down, this has now become not only a flagship mine in Canada, uh, an innovation center for the development of deep drilling technology and deep mining, but the deepest space metal mine in North America. So it's an unparalleled opportunity to get deep into the subsurface. This is some of our team going down there. And then just to give you a quick sense, again, this was a picture I showed you earlier. This is actually from South Africa but I did want to take an opportunity to show you a quick picture of the water from Timmins. So this is actually from that site, from two and a half kilometers below surface. This is the water that has been, has the mean residence time based on the noble gases of uh, a little over a billion years. And this gives you a sense then of the flow, the flow of water, the flow of dissolved uh, energy as well within that. Uh, again, very much a macroscopic phenomenon. So the noble gases then. As I mentioned, these are, of course, inert conservative gases from that column of the periodic table. And so we can use them, and they've been used for, uh, for many, many years, decades, to identify and quantify the origin of fluids and gases in the crust. And that's partly because there's three main sources of noble gas. Uh, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon are what I'll be talking about here. I'll focus, though, primarily on uh, the uh, helium and neon at first. Uh, they come from three main sources. They come from the mantle. They come from the atmosphere, or they are produced in the crust by radiogenic processes. Uh, and I'll focus, in fact, this is the key to understanding the residence time issue. To try to understand that, basically, in this schematic, it gives us some sense of that. Then if we're working with water in the subsurface, and we're trying to understand the sources that are contributing to that water, we can take a look at three different types of noble gas. Again, if we want to understand what may be coming from the magma or the mantle, we can take a look at things like helium-3. Our job on places like the Canadian Shield is actually made much easier. I mentioned earlier these are tectonically quiescent. There is no magmatic or mantle-derived input. So that makes life easier when you work with noble gases in places like the Canadian Shield. There's none of this component at all. And the entire system then reduces to just two potential contributions to noble gases within these fluids. The one of them is, of course, as I mentioned, the radiogenic crustal component, and that's these isotopes of helium, neon, argon, and xenon, for instance. These two are produced by radiogenic processes in the crust. So once again, as things like uranium, thorium, or potassium, and other things decay, they produce as a byproduct alpha, beta, and gamma particles. 
and those particles then, knocking off uh, other elements, produce the radiogenic isotopes. So they're radiogenic, but not radioactive, they're stable. But what it does mean is that the longer water sits in the crust, the more of these it accumulates or picks up over time. So to make it very much oversimplified, the longer the water's there, the more radiogenic isotopes we'll see. And that really is the key to understanding the resonance time issue. The other half of it is understanding connection to surface, and so the other part of it is the uh, noble gases that are in fact atmospheric derived, and these are the isotopes, for instance, like uh, 20 neon for argon-36. These are derived from the atmosphere and then carried into the subsurface by recharge. So they're sometimes referred to as atmospheric noble gases, sometimes as groundwater noble gases. But by measuring this, we can understand connection to surface. By measuring these, we can understand how long a water has been in the crust in the process of long-term water rock reaction. And so really, to keep a long story short, that is the basis of this technique. It's an approach that's been used for a very long time. It's a very well-established approach. The surprise was the order of magnitude. These waters are breaking every record for most radiogenic helium, neon, argon, xenon ever observed on the planet. In fact, when I first stepped into my colleague in Oxford, he's not as familiar with these systems at that time as he's become now, and uh, called him up to say, you know, hey, Chris, how's the data coming? He said, they are, something's wrong, the mass spec's broken. Because nobody thought you could get radiogenic signatures like this on this planet. Now, we now know that it's the case, and this has been verified not only by us, but by labs all around the world. But it was the first to actually see these kinds of highly radiogenic signatures, and then to do the modeling to understand what that meant by residence time. Because it indeed showed us for all four independent radiogenic noble gas isotopes, mean residence times for these fluids of more than a billion years. Prior to that, we thought the oldest water could maybe be on the order of maybe a couple of hundred million years. So this was a major shift in our understanding how old flowing water can be. Now, geologists have been able to get at ancient fluids for a long time. We, there's a, a whole study around things called fluid inclusions, which are microscopic blebs, bubbles, within rocks that are trapped at the time of formation. And from these fluid inclusions, there are vast amounts of literature that's been done to crack them open and measure the fluids that are in them to understand something about what formed the rocks, or indeed to understand about our early atmosphere. So for instance, some of our studies on our Earth's earliest atmosphere come from looking at these fluid inclusions. But what's fascinating is these fluid inclusions have some of the same noble gas signatures as the flowing water that we had. So really, it's the first time we've realized that ancient fluids and gases are available to us in a new kind of sample. We're not restricted just to the microscopic fluid inclusions, but in fact, some of these fluids may actually have isotopic compositions of the noble gases that are the same as the inclusions. So it's the first time we've known we can actually get some samples of ancient fluids and gases that are macroscopic, that are bubbling right up actually, which you can carry liters and liters of material back to the lab with. So it's changing some of our approach to taking a look at early fluids and early atmospheres. But again, I mentioned I wasn't going to focus too much today on the information we get about the early Earth. I was going to focus instead about extant life in the ancient waters. So just to finish, what I do want to do is give you a quick idea of where we're at in the unpublished work, where we're at in terms of understanding life in these ancient fluids, particularly from the Timmins area. So this is just a schematic. Uh, it's a cartoon, really, just to give you some sense of the spectrum of fluids out there that we're looking at. And indeed, we're calling this, in a way, the Galapagos of the deep, in the sense that what we're trying to do is understand these different islands, fractures, isolated waters in the subsurface, that you might think about as islands of life trapped deep within the crust. And we're beginning to measure the resonance time and understand something about how old and the provenance of those waters on different time scales. And now, similar to the Galapagos, we want to understand something about how life differs as we move from one of those systems to another. So this is why this has been coined by my colleague, uh, T.C. Onstad of Princeton, as Galapagos of the Deep. And what we're doing now is moving between these systems, they're all over the world, and trying to characterize the life that's in them. The oldest by far is indeed these waters from Kid Creek. I'll show you a little bit about what we found, again, unpublished work on what we found in Kid Creek. 
Um, but again, lots of work been done on uh, these are the 25 million year old fluids in uh, South Africa. And then work that's been done as well within many of the mines in South Africa where the waters are only tens of thousands of years old. So we're beginning to try to fill in our understanding of where we find life and what it looks like in these different systems. Um, again, in Kid Creek, uh, we're just getting this data up and running. The uh, genomic data has been taken by five different teams, and they're working on the uh, genetic information. Uh, but in addition, we've got a small culturing experience going on right here at the University of Toronto with our students. And essentially, they're being able to show um, a response from hydrogen-utilizing, sulfate-reducing mi microorganisms within the fluid in the present day. Now, there's lots of questions around that still, so I won't dwell too much on it now, but it's certainly an important first step to know that, yes, in the present day, hydrogen reducing sulfate reduces within these waters. Um, again, the reason why you get, expect that is because that's the dominant organism found within the South African system. There we do see a variety of different metabolisms, but the, the winner, the dominant organism, is always a hydrogen utilizing sulfate reducing organism. So in some ways, not too much of a surprise that if we do try to culture these older waters and we see life, that it's life that looks quite a bit like what's been found so far. Um, within the much older system, there's other exciting things going on. Uh, with colleagues recently in these much younger waters, uh, Gaetan Bourgani, who took some of the beautiful photographs that you saw here. It's actually really difficult to take good pictures underground. You need somebody who's really gifted and dedicated to it. And Gaetan, who's our colleague from Belgium, is not only an outstanding photographer, he is a nematode specialist. And one of the other things he did then in some of these younger fluids is we're actually moving up the food chain. We're looking not just at the microorganisms that are surviving on chemosynthesis, but at the organisms that are then consuming those. So this is really one of the first subsurface food chains that has been found uh, within these deep subsurface communities. These are fascinating organisms and really quite frightening. And again, uh, I have it in here for a moment for another lesson in uh, why you have to be careful with the, kind of, the kinds of things that, uh, that sometimes happens with the PR. These have been deemed the worms from hell, which doesn't make you popular with your mining colleagues. Um, but anyway, it's a fascinating uh, side of it. If you're interested in the higher level organisms, I'd certainly encourage you to take a look at some of the papers that, uh, again, were released in part of, but really led by Gaetan Borgeny. Um, but finally, what that leads me to is I just wanted to end, uh, I've talked a lot about this system in South Africa then, uh, the presence of hydrogen utilizing, sulfate reducing organisms, why that's what we would go to look for in Kid Creek. What's fascinating about this organism is uh, T.C. Onstad actually got to name it because it is a new species, or, and uh, he's named it the Dysophorugus odox viator. So I was going to end with an audience participation because I know what an erudite audience I have here, and uh, I just thought I'd ask uh, if anybody has any idea where that comes from. Here's the quote. You can either tell me where it comes from or translate it for me if your Latin is better than mine. Because this is what PC was reading when he decided to name this thing. D. sulfurutus, of course, because it uh, lives off sulfate reduction. But the Odox Viator, coming from this quote, from Jules Verne, which is, if you've read Journey to the Center of the Earth, you'll know there's a critical moment when they realize they're following the path of an ancient explorer and they realize they're on the right path. They're going to find that path down to the center of the earth because inscribed above the entrance in the subsurface is this phrase, descend, bold trapper, and attain the center of the earth. This is the Latin that Jules Verne suggested. I've been told by Latin scholars it's not particularly accurate, but I can take no, no responsibility for that. That's how Jules Verne portrays it in the book. And indeed, Odax Viator then is bold traveler. So uh, this is TC's way of trying to convey some of the excitement and indeed the fact that many of us who do this work have all been uh, uh, sci-fi buffs, but uh, Jules Verne buffs, first and foremost. So with that, I just want to thank you, but also thank all of the bold travelers who've come down with us. This is typically what it looks like when our students are working down there in the dark. Um, and since you don't see a lot of them, I'd like to make sure we've got all of their names up there, because this is really their work. Thank you. <laughs>